And this then takes us to Herzog's concept of ecstatic truth. So in his Minnesota Declaration, which was again delivered on April 30th, 1999, Herzog outlined, I believe, 12 um, key points, as it were, in his uh, 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 conceptualization of what documentary means to him. And I have isolated um, a few of these, a handful of these um, key points. The first being that, as he puts it, by dint of declaration, the so-called cinema verite is devoid of verite. It reaches only a merely superficial truth, the truth of accountants. And if we remember, of course, cinema verite uh, described its, this is to be understood as film truth, right? And I guess the way the Herzog is deploying the notion of cinema verite is a very naive conception of you point the camera at the world in an observational way and it shows you that thing. Therefore, it is uh, represented to you, to the subject. Um, and this is what prompts Herzog to say that cinema verite confounds fact and truth and thus plows only stones. And yet, facts sometimes have a strange and bizarre power that makes their inherent truth seem unbelievable. And he goes on, facts, fact creates norms, but truth creates illumination. And finally, there are deeper strata of truth in cinema, and there is such a thing as poetic, ecstatic truth. It is mysterious and elusive, and it can be reached only through fabrication and imagination and stylization. And so it is fabrication and imagination and stylization that are present not only in Herzog's fiction films, uh, which he'd been making since the late mid to late 1960s through to the present, but also in his non, so-called non-fiction or documentary films, which also deploy fabrication, imagination, and stylization. stylization. And for these reasons, Herzog um, has always been very reluctant to draw any real hard and fast distinctions between his uh, feature fiction films and his documentary films. I think in many ways he sees them as all of, of, of one piece. Now in his essay, on the absolute, the sublime, and the ecstatic truth, he expands on this notion of, um, of, of ecstasy. He writes, we must ask of reality, how important is it really? And how important really is the factual? Of course, we can't disregard the factual. It has normative power, but it can never give us the kind of illumination, the ecstatic flash from which truth emerges. If only the factual, upon which the so-called cinema verite fixate, were of significance, then one could argue that the verite, the truth, and its most concentrated, must reside in the telephone book, in its thousands of entries that are all factually correct, and so correspond to reality. If we were to call everyone listed in the phone book under the name Schmidt, hundreds of those we call would confirm that they are called Schmidt. Yes, their name is Schmidt. So Herzog, again, is getting at this conception of truth uh, through imagination, through fabrication, and so forth, as something that isn't simply about correspondence. It isn't simply about, oh, this, uh, you know, this, the image of the thing is equal to the thing as it appears to stand to our consciousness, in, uh, uh, you know, in the sort of natural world, as it were. The film image, the photographic image, the artistic image, the aesthetic approach to something shouldn't simply reproduce uh, the things of the world uh, in their sort of, um, you know, as um, as objects um, that you know are just uh, simply that objects. It is in fact the object in its relationship to the subject, to the subject and their desires, and the uh, to the subject and their ability to understand it. Uh, to move through it, to make it meaningful and part of their lives, and so forth. And so again, these concepts of the beautiful and the sublime become extremely important in um, attempting to uh, grapple and critique uh, Herzog's own films um, on, in these terms. And so finally, I think this is the one. This is the last. Uh, Point in Herzog's list in the Minnesota Declaration, um, in which he positions himself against what he calls the truth of accountants, the truth uh, as understood by, as at least as he explains it, uh, traditional cinema verite filmmakers. Although I think we would want, in some ways, to complicate uh, Herzog's um, sort of straw man that he constructs out of the cinema verite filmmakers. But uh, nevertheless, he writes, uh, "quote You know, and this is again, this is a sort of sublime conception of." Um, 
of, 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 you know, of humanity and its relationship to the world, he writes, quote, Life in the oceans must be sheer hell, a vast, merciless hell of permanent and immediate danger, so much of a hell that during evolution some species, including man, crawled, fled onto some small continents of solid land where the lessons of darkness continue. So Herzog is positioning himself in a way, uh, in his work, in a way relative to, you know, not just any one individual story, but each of these uh, stories and subjects and, and images and films are actually telling us something about the larger fate of the human species itself, the larger fate of the earth, the fate of life on this earth, and the fate of, like, as it were, then life in the universe. So each of these are actually part of a larger sort of chronicle and vision of uh, sort of the human struggle and the human condition, um, which spans um, many centuries for Herzog. And so this takes us to Matthew Gandhi's conception of what he calls Herzog as melancholy observer related to landscape neo-romanticism and the politics of documentary filmmaking. And Gandhi observes that, quote, there is an eschatological aspect to Herzog's films that seeks an inner truth through extreme encounters with danger, deprivation, and death, landscape emerges as a dramatic provocation for Herzog and his cinematic protagonists, an existential motif for mortality that contrasts the ephemerality of human life with the indifference and infinitude of nature. So this is a very uh, neo-romantic conception, right, that Gandhi is, is uh, developing in here in his reading of Herzog. And when he describes Herzog's films as having an es eschatological aspect, what he's effectively saying is that in terms of eschat eschatology, Herzog, again, is drawn to this, the ultimate fate of um, humankind, the ultimate fate of life on this earth, in particular human life. And so, again, this takes us back to... Um, Sublime Terror, just to return, right, to Burke, to which I opened this uh, lecture, as he said, again, whatever is fitted in any sort to excite the ideas of pain and danger, that is to say, whatever is any sort terrible or is analogous to terror is a source of the sublime. That is, it is productive of the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. So again, uh, as Gandhi pointed out, Herzog uh, sort of famous for these, uh, you know, venturing all over the world and all over the world, to all the continents of the world, and all the various types of landscapes and climates of the world, in his this effort, and perhaps it's a neo-colonial effort. This is what Gandhi's party partly getting at, um, in spite of in spite of Herzog's some of Herzog's own proclamations otherwise, that um, uh, Herzog is 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 trying to um, uh, increase the power of his own life by a confrontation, as it were, with death or near-death experiences or with danger, right? These sublime encounters with nature, with the landscape. And this takes me to the final slide of um, this part of the lecture. Um, in his, um, in Les Blank's documentary film about the making of Herzog's film Fitzcarraldo from the early 1980s, uh, there, is a, there was a famous, um, it's become almost um, comical at this point, the amount of times it's been cited and commented upon. But there is a famous interview where Herzog, during the making of his film Fitzcarraldo, which we see Herzog showing um, a scene or a scene of the production on the right here, we have Herzog describing, um, again, his sort of conception of nature, uh, in which he says, quote, the trees are in misery and the birds are in misery. I don't think they sing, they just screech in pain. Taking a close look at what's around us, there is some sort of harmony. It's the harmony of overwhelming and collective murder. Now, so Herzog's sort of existentialist, neo-romanticist kind of confrontation with nature that he's outlining here, sort of indifferent brutality of nature, um, it perhaps needs to be further contextualized in terms of what uh, the critique, one of the critiques of Herzog, and in particular Fitzcarraldo, uh, which we do, again, we see... Uh, uh, one of the settings of Fitzcarraldo on the right here, in the right image which Herzog is pointing at, which was, um, you know, a film about, we're seeing here a ship in this film about um, uh, among, um, a, robber, a rubber baron um, who wanted to uh, sail down the Amazon and want, needed to, um, in his mind, he wanted to have an opera ship, a large barge, 
that had opera performed on it, and he wanted it to be pulled in, over a mountain so it could reach another waterway. This was the f easiest way to do so. And during the making of the film, Herzog himself had this ship, uh, you know, very famously uh, pulled over this mountain. And um, I be uh, believe that, in fact, some people died. Um, some of the indigenous people who were working as laborers on the production of Fitzcarraldo died. And Herzog um, has, um, since, you know, during the making of that and since, uh, has in part been seen as a kind of um, colonialist of sorts, uh, you, know, Europe, you know, European figure who, um, um, uh, with, you know, basic, you know, indifference like that he ascribes to nature, his own indifference to the life, the life and um, uh, the lives and um, happiness of those uh, indigenous peoples that he encounters, um, themselves being sort of subordinated to his own neo-romantic quest, his own uh, wanderlust, and so forth. And um, we can also see how that might play out in uh, Lessons of Darkness and in his own, in Herzog's own critique of Grizzly Man. So this takes us to the end of part one, and um, I look forward to discussing part two of the lecture with you.